Technology moves quick. What once seemed impossible is now possible. At first, people are excited about new technology. Then it becomes part of the landscape. No longer special, it's the new normal. Early Americans traveled everywhere on horseback. Don't see a lot of that anymore. Yesterday, I drove, I drove all the way across town, didn't see a single horse-drawn wagon. Although with gas prices the way they are, we probably should consider it. The new normal is cars, or in my case, a truck. I'm thankful for that new normal. When Cindy and I were dating, uh, we were going to two different schools, hundreds of miles away. I sent her what was called letters. <laughs> I actually wrote words on a piece of paper, folded it up, sprayed a little cologne on it. <laughs> Come on, you know you did the same thing. Tell the truth. Put it in an envelope and mailed it. And if everything went right, three days later, Cindy got the letter. And I wrote lots of letters. I wrote long letters, six, seven pages long on legal, legal pad. And about every fourth letter, Cindy would write back. <laughs> usually about one paragraph on a piece of paper about that size. <laughs> now we communicate instantly with text and FaceTime. And that's a, most of the time, that's a good new normal. A telephone, students, this is going to take a second to believe. It used to have two cords. Okay? So first there was a cord that went into the wall. And like if you wanted to have a private conversation and you, you're talking to your girlfriend, you didn't want your parents to hear, and your parents are really nice, they'd buy like a 75-foot long cord that goes into the wall. And so you could carry that phone, still plugged into the wall, all the way to your room and talk on the phone. So I had to plug into the, into the wall. And then that thingy on top of that other thingy, it was called a handset. And there was a cord, the coiled cord that connected the handset to the phone. And, and you turn those dials, it took forever, and you could call someone. You, you had to actually know their number. You didn't just program in your phone. You had to memorize their number. We didn't call it a landline because there were no other kinds of lines. It was just a line. It was a phone. And for that matter, there used to be something called pay phones. They were in the airport. They were in the mall. They were in restaurants. Sometimes you'd be driving down the street, and like on a random corner, there'd be a phone. It was how convenient. Just when you needed it, there was a phone. And for only 10 cents, later 25 cents, you could call somebody if they lived in the same city. And then if you talked too long, the operator would come on or later a computerized voice and tell you to put more money in the phone. And now you don't see pay phones anywhere but the movies. Cell phones are the new normal. In the old days, if you wanted to take a picture of something, you used something called a camera. And it was filled with something called film that looked a little like this. And then if you did that and you took the film out, camera's, picture's no good because you exposed the film. So you would you'd take the pictures and then you would take this little canister of film and you would put it in an envelope and you would mail it off. And then if you were lucky, 10 days later, you would get some pictures back in the mail and you would see if the pictures were good. Now you take out your phone, you take a picture, you look at the picture, you decide you don't look cute enough. And so you retake the picture, you add some filters, you make yourself look younger, prettier, you take out the wrinkles, you take the gray out of your hair, you make yourself glow or sparkle, and then you post the a uh, very heavily photoshopped image of yourself on Instagram to share with all your friends. That's the new normal. I love technology. I, I enjoy learning new, better ways to do things. There's a lot to like about the new normals. When you become a follower of Jesus, it leads to a new normal way of living. The principle is Jesus on the inside changes the outside. 
If following Jesus doesn't change what's normal, then you're not really following it. Paul from prison wrote a letter to the believers in Ephesus, a church divided by prejudice between Jews and Gentiles. They were also struggling to live for Jesus in an evil pagan society. Paul answered for them and for us what normal is supposed to look like for a follower of Jesus. Our goal is to be biblical Christians, not defined by our political party, our, the language we speak, our country of origin, uh, culture, society, but following the Bible. A biblical Christian whose life has been changed by Jesus is supposed to be radically different in a way that other people can notice. So we pick it up in chapter 5, verse 1. Be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children. The therefore refers back to chapter 4, verse 32, that said, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. You've been forgiven. Now imitate God by forgiving others in the same way God forgave you. And I could probably stop right there. Because some of you are holding a grudge against another Christian. You were offended or hurt. Someone did something or they didn't do what you thought they should do or they said something. And now rather than imitate God and forgive, you have anger and resentment towards them. You cleverly post on Facebook to take shots with words and pictures you know will hurt. But then if somebody accuses you, you say, well, I just posted a picture. You unfriend a fellow believer, letting them know, not only am I not forgiving you, I don't plan to. I'm deleting you from my life. You no longer matter to me. I'm mad, and I'm going to stay mad. That attitude, attitude hurts you and is an embarrassment to the kingdom. I mean, I get it. You were hurt. You don't have to go back to being their buddy or their best friend, but you do need to act like a Christian instead of a petty, immature, angry sinner. You've been forgiven, so forgive each other. Be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children. Children learn how to act by watching their parents. If you watch a child, their mannerisms, their gestures, the way they talk, even the way they respond to pressure and conflict, you see a reflection of their parents. I love watching a kid worshiping next to her parents. They raise their hands the same way. They worship the same way because they learn to worship or they learn not to worship by imitating their parents. Children imitate parents. As a parent, that's really exciting. And the reason you don't hear people clapping is because it's also really frightening because your kids don't just imitate your good qualities, they also imitate your weaknesses. If you are a liar, your kids will likely be liars. If you are loud and angry, your children will also struggle. If you have a pattern of unresolved conflict, your kids will do the same. If you think pickles are evil, they will think pickles are evil. <laughs> Can I get a witness? You want your children to imitate your good qualities. You don't want them to imitate your bad qualities. I've heard people criticize because they imitate someone. Well, you're just acting like Pastor Parker. Well, that's a good thing. You resemble who you respect and admire. If you respect and admire me and spend time with me, you'll resemble me. You'll take on my attitudes and characteristics. Paul said, be imitators of God. So if you respect, admire, worship, and follow Jesus, you should begin to resemble Jesus. There's no greater compliment when someone says, I see Jesus in you. When I think about God, you're what comes to mind. People who don't know God are just know that you're different from the critical, angry people around them. That's completely awesome, and that's supposed to be totally normal. Be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children. Live a life of love. When I die, I'd like people to say that about me. He lived a life of love. 
live a life of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Biblical love isn't a feeling or a fleeting emotion. It's a choice. It's a decision and a willingness to sacrifice. That kind of love isn't based on whether you think someone's attractive. God didn't fall in love with you after he saw you. He loved you from the beginning. His love is unconditional, extravagant. In fact, he loved you enough to die for you. When you give up your wants, your needs, your desires, your preferences, and to put others first, when you willingly sacrifice for others, you resemble Jesus. Alan Kreider wrote a book about early Christians titled The Patient Ferment of the Early Church. I want to read you just a little bit of it. Outsiders looked at the Christians and saw them energetically feeding poor people and burying them, caring for boys and girls who lacked property and parents, and being attentive to aged slaves and prisoners. They interpreted these actions as a work of love, and they said, Look how they love one another. They did not say, listen to the Christian's message. They did not say, read what they write. Hearing and reading were important, and some early Christians worked to communicate in those ways too. But we must not miss the reality. The pagans said, look, Christianity's truth was visible. It was embodied and enacted by its members in such a way that people saw the difference. People became Christians because they observed people who were Christians and acted like Jesus. Love for others attracted people to faith, even though becoming a Christian could mean death. If we really love people like Jesus did, we will see more people come to faith in Jesus. We don't need better preaching, better worship, better air conditioning, or a better building. We need better lives. Another important part of imitating God is getting rid of the things in your life that do not resemble him. That's where Paul went next. And now this takes a more difficult turn. Among you, there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or any kind of impurity. The principle is whatever God establishes, Satan counterfeits. God establishes true love. Satan produces counterfeit love, what the world considers normal. Counterfeit love is conditional and self-centered. It's about getting what I want, what I think I need, not about giving. Counterfeit love leads to immorality and impurity. Immorality refers to all sexual sin. Impurity is a more general term meaning anything unclean or filthy. It refers to immoral thoughts, fantasies, and every other form of sexual corruption. Premarital and other immoral sex and sexual humor were just as common in ancient society as they are today. Paul did not water down God's standards to accommodate culture. He called Christians to a higher standard. Now, inevitably... When I talk about sex, I get a, an angry email challenging me and saying, I don't think we should talk about that in church. Really? Where should we talk about it? Should we let culture and society set the standard and ignore God's standard? Doesn't make any sense. Save your email because I'm going to talk about it because the Bible talks about it. We live in a world where sex, immorality, and impurity are easily accessible just a click away. If you enter the word sex in Google, Google, don't do it, you'll get over 5 billion results. Pornography addiction is more widespread and difficult to avoid than ever before. The average age of first exposure to pornography keeps going down. It's now 11 years old which means that most of the students sitting in front of me have already in some way be expo been exposed to pornography. Just one porn website, just one, reports 130 million visitors a day. 
There's 7.7 billion people on the planet. This one website reported 42 billion visits a year. By the way, porn is not just an issue for men. 35% of visitors were women. Immorality and impurity is all around us. I fear for our students and children. I pray for our students and children that they will be able to live morally and sexually pure in an incredibly impure world. It's possible. In fact, it's supposed to be normal for God's children. I talk to our students every year about sex. And every year I have to be more plain spoken and more direct because it's more in their face. Uh, first person with their outline, 100 bucks. <laughs> wow, that was fast, Ava. You, and so they, they do an outline, and I, I want them to always have the outline with them because I want the truth to stay with them. So every once in a while, I give away 100 bucks to the first person who has theirs. Well done. There you go. There's 100 bucks. Enjoy that. And, and then I tell them if they'll live by that, yeah, on their wedding day, they can trade me that outline and I'll give them $100. And uh, I'm at about, oh, over the span of time now, I think I've given about $6,000 away. And you say, Pastor Rod, that's a lot of money. They're worth it. Amen. Absolutely worth it. Among you, Paul said, there must not be a hint of sexual immorality, any kind of impurity, or greed. It's interesting, Paul listed greed with sexual immorality and impurity. Greed's worshiping money and possessions instead of God. It's living to get ahead instead of living to give. The greedy person is consumed with what they want when they want it. And over the years, I've observed when there are issues of sexual immorality, most of the time there's also issues with money. When someone says, comes to me and says, my husband is having an affair or my wife is having an affair, one of the first things I ask is, have you checked the money? And you wouldn't believe the answer is, well, she wouldn't do that. Or my husband's too honest to steal from me. The same greedy character that will allow someone to have an affair will produce greed in other areas as well. Failure rarely happens in isolation. In fact, the source of sexual sin is often greed. Give me what I want, what I need, what I desire. That's greed, living to fulfill your own desires. That's one reason why we stress tithing, giving the first 10% of your income to God, because that's a control in your life that helps you avoid being greedy. If you're a single adult, listen to me, don't marry someone who isn't a tither. Because if they'll steal from God, they will steal from you. Say, how will I know? Ask them. If you don't believe them, ask to see their tax return. Check it out. If they still won't tell you, bring them to me. We'll find out. Be careful. We live in a greedy, immoral, impure world. The church in Ephesus this letter was originally written to lived in that same kind of society. Paul said, among you, there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or any kind of impurity or greed because these are improper for God's holy people. That is a high standard. Paul didn't say there must not be sexual immorality, impurity, or greed. Paul didn't say don't view pornography, don't have an affair, don't watch raunchy movies. What he said was, not even a hint of those things. Don't even allow a little bit. The dictionary definition of hint is a very slight or hardly noticeable amount. So let's plug that definition into the verse and see what normal is supposed to be. Among you, there must not be even a very slight or hardly noticeable amount of sexual immorality, any kind of impurity, or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. I like smoothies. One of my favorites is peanut butter cup. It's good. It's healthy. It's got chocolate. It's got peanut butter. It's got bananas. It's got a big old pile of sugar. 
probably has some gluten. I love gluten. If it doesn't, I ask him, just add some gluten. <laughs> Nothing better. This one's special. It's got chocolates, banana, peanut butter, sugar, gluten, and a little tiny bit of rat poison. <laughs> now, you might not notice this as you're drinking it, but if you drink it, it'll kill you. No one in their right mind would drink a smoothie with even a little tiny bit of poison. Yet you allow hints of what the Bible says is poison to your mind, your spirit, and your soul. Sexual sin destroys marriages, families, and futures. It damages your testimony, and it puts you in danger of missing heaven. It's time people in the church quit sleeping around, stop compromising sexual standards, and instead look like Jesus. I'm not going to avoid talking about sex because it makes you uncomfortable or because you think I'm targeting you. The old timers used to say, if you throw a rock in a pack of dogs, the one who yelps is the one that got hit. Of course people in sexual sin don't want me to talk about it. If you feel like I'm targeting you when I talk about sexual sin, you need to examine your life and live like a child of God instead of living like a puppet of our sin-sick, sex-saturated society. And your tendency then is to say, okay, Rod, define it for me. Tell me what I can do, what I can't do. Give me a list. How far is too far? How much is too much? Where's the line? I'm not going to fall for that trap. Because if I give you a list, you'll just want to argue the list. I'll be called judgmental or old-fashioned or out of touch. I won't give you a list because the Bible does a good job of drawing the line. Here's the line. Anything you do that even hints at sexual immorality, impurity, or greed is wrong. If it gives someone the slightest impression of those things, it should be eliminated from your life. It's not proper for God's people. If it's in the smallest way, immoral, impure, or greedy, that doesn't fit the new normal for a follower of Jesus. You say, Pastor Ron, give me a break. If I have to live up to that standard, I'll have to be careful about everything I say, everything I watch, everything I do. I'll have to reevaluate my relationships and my friendships and where I hang out. I'll have to unsubscribe to some cable channels. I'll have to reorder my finances. I might even have to sell or give away some stuff. I'll have to change everything. According to Paul, yes. That's supposed to be normal for followers of Jesus. And he goes on. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place. But instead of that, thanksgiving. Your thinking affects your talking and your acting. If you don't think that way or talk that way, you'll be less likely to act that way. Now, I understand people have different different definitions of what's obscene or what's a curse word. I've even seen the arguments online, is this a swear word? Paul understood that, so he closed the loophole. He said, no obscenity. In case you're not sure something obscene, no foolish talk, no coarse joking, no sexual innuendo, finding hidden double meanings in something that's innocent, no dirty jokes, no racial jokes. Those are out of place for followers of Jesus. When you talk like that, you're talking like people who don't know him. Jesus said, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. King James says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him. The evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. According to Jesus, there are no excuses. What comes out of your mouth is from your heart. If good words come out, it's because you have a good heart. If evil words come out, that's because evil's in your heart. You reveal your relationship with Jesus or your lack of it by your words. Obscenity, coarse joking, foolish words are the result of a heart that needs to be transformed. 
We, we cannot excuse the hurtful, harmful, gossiping, critical, angry, evil words of others and say, well, that's just how she is. She grew up in the South. Or she can't help it. You're right, she can't help it. And the reason she can't help it is because her heart is evil. If she'll accept Jesus and let him transform her life, then she'll change. When you commit your life to Jesus, it's supposed to change the words that come out of your mouth. Jesus on the inside changes the outside. How? Look back at the verse. Instead of foolish, normal talk that doesn't please God, replace that with thanksgiving, with gratitude. Be thankful for what God has given you. Instead of looking for what's bad, look for what's good and right. Instead of using people, serve people. You should be known by your words of gratitude. And here's one more thing that'll help you. Slow down. Think before you talk. Consider what you're about to say and ask yourself, what kind of people would tell this joke? What kind of people are most likely to use this word or this phrase? Is this normal for people who don't follow Jesus? Will these words draw people to or push people from Jesus? Does this sound like something that comes out of a pure, holy heart? If it doesn't, don't say it. Are these words positive and encouraging? Am I thinking about the needs of others or just myself? Out of your righteous heart, your words are different. Tell the truth. Be positive and encouraging. Build people up. Don't tear people down. Don't use curse words, evil words, or words that commonly come from an evil heart. Instead, speak words of thanksgiving. Make a decision to talk different and repent and ask God to forgive you for words that aren't pleasing to him. And then Paul continued. And just in case this audience thought it was optional, in case you think it's unreasonable, Paul made the consequences of not adopting the new normal very clear. You can be sure of this, he said. No immoral, impure, or greedy person. Such a man is an idolater. In other words, That person puts something else before God. No immoral, impure, or greedy person has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. See, some of you have made this a preference issue. He's old-fashioned. There's no harm in this. He's just trying to be super holy, but we don't have to live that way. God hasn't said anything to me about it. I can handle it. Too many Christians apply the individualistic, independent ideas of our culture to relationship with God. But there is no opting out when it comes to the Bible. This is not a matter of conviction. This is a command. And in Scripture, commands are followed by one of two things, a blessing or a consequence. A blessing if you obey, a consequence if you disobey. Here's the powerful principle. When you turn a command into a conviction, you risk the consequence. When God says, do this or don't do this, and you choose to disobey because that doesn't apply to me or that seems unreasonable, you forfeit the blessing and choose the consequence. In this case, the consequence is tough. No immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a man as an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. No one whose life pattern is one of immorality, impurity, and greed, can be part of God's kingdom because that person doesn't resemble God in any way. If you are immoral, impure, or greedy, you're not living as God's children. This is a big deal. There's a lot riding on this. Heaven's at stake. Among you, there must not be a hint of sexual immorality, any kind of impurity or greed, These are improper for God's holy people. And the next two verses may not seem connected, but they are. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them. Be careful. Let no one deceive you with empty words, telling you that sexual sin is okay and that it won't keep you out of heaven. Don't be fooled. 
Don't let these kind of empty words convince you that it's okay. Well, everybody's going to heaven in the end. It doesn't matter. Live how you want. You pray to prayer. You're good. It's okay because, after all, God wants you to be happy. The Bible doesn't say that. He wants you to be holy and make heaven. But we can have sex now because we're married in God's eyes. It's okay. You can do it. God knows your heart. Well, yeah, he knows your heart, and he knows it's evil. It's okay. If everybody does it, it's not sin. That list is created by people who want to excuse their lifestyle and actions and justify sin. Paul said, don't be partners with them. In other words, don't intimately connect yourself to people who live immoral, impure, greedy lives and try to convince you to do the same. Be separate. Why? Verse 8, 9, 10. For you were once darkness, but now you're light in the Lord. Live as children of the light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, and find out what pleases the Lord. You used to be in darkness, greedy, sexually immoral darkness. Now you're in the light. You live to Jesus. Live like it. You can sum up these verses, this passage, these 10 verses in two phrases, six words. The book of Christians, number one, love people to Jesus. We will never argue people to Jesus. I've yet to meet the person who says, I was in an angry argument on Facebook and it convinced me that I needed to come to church. We love people to Jesus. That's why we're doing Easter special things for kids in Arkansas Children's Hospital and kids at Hillcrest Children's Home because our, our command from the Lord is that we love people to him. And then number two, live different. Students live different from other, other students at school. If you live just like them, you're not being imitators of God. You're being imitation, imitators of them. Adults, you're not off the hook. Live different. Would you bow your heads with me? I want to pray for you. I want to pray for you, if you say, Pastor Rod, uh, if the standard is not even a hint, I'm guilty. And I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand because everyone in this room would raise their hand. It's time we live not by our culture's standard, but by God's standard. And we have allowed the culture around us to change what's right. And we've got to get back to Scripture, what the Bible says. So I want to pray for you. Lord, we ask your forgiveness. Forgive us, Lord, for allowing even a hint of impurity sexual immorality and greed. Forgive us, Lord, for tolerating things we once believed were sin because we've just gotten used to it. It's become a new normal. And help us have the new normal of someone who is following you. Lord, I pray that we would live different and it would be noticed that our normal would be different than the normal people around us. And then, Lord, we pray that you would help us love people to Jesus. People would see our love for each other and our love for them and be drawn to you. Help us to be different. In Jesus' name. Lord, I pray for our students today. Lord, so many influences on them and they are surrounded by sex and things that pull them towards impurity and immorality. Lord, I pray that they would live different, that they would have high standards and live according to them. I pray that they would be pure in an impure world. They would love you with their whole hearts and that would be reflected in what they do, what they say, what they watch, where they go. I pray you would protect them from people that try to draw them to wrong and instead they would live right 
We plead the blood of Jesus over our students today. We intercede for them, recognizing that the world they live in is more evil than it's ever been before. Lord, I pray that the Spirit of God would raise up a standard in them that they would say no to wrong and yes to right, and they would live holy, pure lives that are blessed by you. And I pray that their parents would set such powerful examples of righteousness that they would have someone in something to follow. We pray you'd watch over them and bless them today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.